All right, good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about reverse transcription. We're going to talk about viruses that have reverse transcriptase in their reproductive cycle, which includes the retroviruses. Really interesting, and this will follow us for quite a few more lectures. And as Alice said, or the Queen, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So you have to believe the impossible. That's what we're going to see today. Now this uh, story begins way back at the beginning of the 1900s with two discoveries. The first in 1908, a discovery of a virus that causes leukemia in chickens by Bang and Ellerman, these two gentlemen here on the lower left. And this uh, was the first cancer virus discovered. A few years later, Peyton Rouse discovered another virus that causes cancer. This one causes solid cancer called a sarcoma, and that was called Rouse sarcoma virus, his name. He was working right here in New York at the Rockefeller, at the time it was the Rockefeller Medical Institute. 55 years later, he got the Nobel Prize for this discovery, the longest incubation period for a Nobel Prize ever. And why it took so long, we'll see later when we talk about transformation and oncogenesis. So eventually these were called tumor viruses, as they cause cancers in animals. And they were eventually found to have RNA genomes that took much longer, as you might guess. And then they were called RNA tumor viruses. And there are also DNA viruses that cause tumors and cancers and Guess what they're called? DNA tumor viruses. So just to keep them straight, we're going to talk about them separately. But today we're going to talk about these. Now, when people found out that these viruses had RNA in them, they were really intrigued because you inf here's the story. And in fact, this is something worked out by Howard Temin, who was a virologist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, also received the Nobel Prize for his work. He was reasoning, first of all, he found out that you could take cells in culture and infect them with these RNA tumor viruses and they would permanently transform the cells. We'll see what transform means in a couple of lectures, but they would introduce complete changes in the way the cells behaved and they were permanent. So he reckoned this has to be a DNA intermediate because in order to change the cell's property, it has to be a DNA introduced because the RNA, as far as we know, wouldn't remain there. His logic was retroviruses cause permanent changes in the cells. He also found that the viral DNA was integrated into the cell's genome. It became a permanent part of it. He called it the provirus, that is the integrated viral DNA is a provirus. So he reasoned there must be an enzyme in these viruses that converts the RNA to DNA. So that was his reasoning. Others were also thinking similar thoughts. And at the same time in Nature, the, the papers were both published showing that these viruses contain an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So here's Howard Temin's paper, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in, in uh, Rouse sarcoma virus. And then David Baltimore, who we've talked about before, who developed the Baltimore scheme, he also discovered the enzyme, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in RNA tumor viruses. And these are abstracts from the paper, uh, and they both basically say infection of cells by RNA sarcoma viruses requires the syn synthesis of new DNA. It's sensitive to actinomycin D, uh, and the cells transformed have new DNA which hybridizes with viral RNA. And he called that the provirus hypothesis. Replication of RNA tumor viruses takes place through DNA intermediate. So both of them purified virus particles and did an enzyme assay and found in the particle there's this new enzyme that nobody had ever seen before, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. Both of them got Nobel Prizes for this discovery. So that enzyme is reverse transcriptase. And it is so-called because it countered the central dogma of biology, which is that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. And this was kind of formulated uh, by many people, but Watson and Crick in particular, although when reverse transcriptase was discovered, Francis Crick said, I never said there was a central dogma. 
So the, the reverse transcriptase reverses the flow of genetic information. You go from RNA to DNA. You can't go any further than that. You have to go back to RNA and protein. But it can reverse part of this flow of information. And so that's why it was called reverse transcriptase. And then those RNA tumor viruses were then called retroviruses. A little better name because they contain reverse transcriptase. So this enzyme revolutionized molecular biology in many fields because, first of all, you could now take any RNA, incubate it with this enzyme, and make a DNA copy of it. You could then clone that DNA in a plasmid and get tons of it for study. So any therapeutic use of a protein which re relies on recombinant DNA, the entire field founded by reverse transcriptase plus the ability to clone genes into plasmid, you know, any therapeutic protein is, is depends on reverse transcriptase. Many other applications. For example, now when you look for viruses in clinical specimens by reverse transcriptase PCR, RT-PCR, you extract RNA, you convert it to DNA, and then you do a PCR reaction. So it's an essential part of detection and research. It's just incredible, and that's why these individuals got uh, the Nobel Prize for discovering it. So today we're going to talk about two different virus families that have reverse transcriptase as part of their reproductive cycle. They are, of course, shown here on the Baltimore scheme. We have our seven RNA genome types. Now we've lost the numeral seven for, for hepatitis B virus. Today we're going to talk about the viruses in red. The retroviruses, of course, uh, they take RNA and go convert it to DNA, so they contain reverse transcriptase in their reproductive cycles. But we'll also talk about a DNA virus, hepatitis B virus, which has that funny double-stranded gapped molecule. And you wouldn't be able to guess it, but this has reverse transcriptase in its reproductive cycle as well. So in fact, both viral genomes, retroviral and hepatitis B virus genomes, encode reverse transcriptase, and it's part of their reproductive cycles, as you'll see today. This is not something you would predict from looking at the Baltimore scheme for the hepatitis B virus, because you would think, ah, oh, this just replicates through a DNA intermediate, but it doesn't. So here is a retrovirus schematic. On the left is an electron micrograph of the purified particles. And these are envelope particles. You can see the envelope around the outside. And inside, there's some electron-dense material. It's dark on the EM, and that's what we call the core of the particle. On the right is a schematic of what it looks like. We have an envelope surrounding the particle, and within the envelope are glycoproteins. These are called envelope, or ENV, glycoproteins. They consist of two parts. There's a part embedded in the membrane called transmembrane, and there's a part on the surface called SU, or surface. Uh, below the membrane, we have a matrix protein. It's shown in blue here. This is present in a lot of envelope viruses. It gives structure to the envelope, to the lipid bilayer. And then within it, uh, we have a capsid, which is built with the principles of icosahedral symmetry for some retroviruses. And within it is an RNA. So it's a nucleocapsid. The RNA is actually coated in protein. Uh, and this capsid also contains other proteins besides those coding the RNA, which of course is a plus strand RNA, it's shown in green. We have protease, we have integrase, and of course reverse transcriptase. So this RNA, when it gets into a cell, is not going to be translated. It's the one exception of the plus strand RNA viruses where the plus strand is not translated. You'll see why in a moment. Now here's a schematic of the genome so you understand what's encoded and how it's expressed. On the top is the genome. We're showing this as proviral DNA. That means, of course, that we're, it's integrated into the host cell DNA. And we're just showing the virus part. There's no host DNA here. So we have at either end some purplish sequences labeled LTR, long terminal repeats pretty much explains itself. Two sequences at either ends that are repeated. And then in the middle is the coding region for the viral genome, which is in the blue, the two strands of DNA. This is an example of a retrovirus with a simple genome, as opposed to HIV, which has a complex genome we'll talk about later. This encodes just about a dozen proteins. And they're, linked, they're grouped into three parts, the gag, the pall, and the envelope 
regions. GAG means group antigen. It was named this long ago. These are the structural proteins that make up the capsid, the matrix protein that lines the underside of the membrane, the protease, those are all in the, in the GAG region. In the middle, we have the PAL, the polymerase coding region. This encodes reverse transcriptase and integrase. These are two proteins essential for the reproductive cycle of these viruses. And finally, at the right end, the envelope, this is the glycoprotein that is inserted into the membrane of the virus. And we have the TM and the SU portions, the transmembrane and the surface. They're actually made as separate proteins. And they are joined non-covalently. Now this genome is present in, integrated into the host cell. It is copied, it is transcribed by host cell DNA polymerase to give an mRNA. And this is a full length mRNA. It doesn't actually go from end to end uh, of the provirus. We'll see that in a moment, but it is the um, viral RNA that's found in virus particles. It comes in spliced and unspliced versions, unspliced at the top. That is translated. You can see it's capped and polyadenylated. It is translated to produce the GAG protein, giving you structural proteins. But after the GAG, there is a stop codon. It has to be suppressed in some way to give you a longer protein, which is a GAG pole precursor. This now has the protein encoding the reverse transcriptase. And these are all, these are processed or cleaved away from the GAG proteins by uh, protease, the protease that's actually encoded in the genome. It's a really interesting process. You don't need a lot of enzyme, so this suppression of the stop codon doesn't have to happen all the time. About 10% of the time that the ribosomes reach this stop codon, it's suppressed and you get a longer product. So that's the way you access the enzyme in this coding region. Then there's one spliced mRNA, which is shown at the bottom. It's singly spliced. It removes the gag in the Paul coding region, and that's how you produce the envelope protein because again, there's a termination codon after the Paul gene, so you can't get to the envelope protein, even by suppression, that won't work. So you make a separate mRNA for the envelope protein. And here, we need to package into virus particles the full length mRNA, of course. It's an unspliced mRNA. We talked a few sessions ago about how unspliced RNAs get out of the nucleus to allow packaging into virus particles. All right, so that's the overall scheme of how this genome is expressed. Let's look at the reproductive cycle. The virus binds receptors, many different receptors uh, utilized for these viruses. Here we're showing fusion at the plasma membrane. For some retroviruses, that's what's happening. And then the core, that is the icosahedral core with the RNA, and it gets into the cytoplasm. And it is right there in the cytoplasm that this plus RNA is reverse transcribed and a double-stranded DNA copy is made. That plus RNA cannot be translated. It's shielded from ribosomes, right? This, it remains in a subviral structure through which NTPs can pass, DNTPs, to make the viral DNA, but ribosomes cannot get at this plus RNA. That's why it's not translated. If you extracted the RNA and took it away from all protein and put it in a cell, it would be translated, and it could initiate an infectious cycle. So the DNA is made in the cytoplasm. It's then imported into the nucleus. It integrates into chromosomal DNA. We're going to look at that reaction. In fact, all these reactions in some detail. And you can see the proviral DNA is blue. The, the host chromosomal DNA is purple. And there, it is transcribed by host cell DNA, RNA polymerase 2, Paul 2, to make mRNAs. It makes uh, long mRNAs, uh, which are exported, unspliced, to produce the GAG and the Paul proteins. And then it is spliced to a smaller RNA to make the envelope glycoproteins. And those get embedded uh, in the ER and are shipped up to the cell surface to make new virus particles. This process of assembly we'll talk about next time. The key points here are the RNA is reverse transcribed in the cytoplasm. The double-stranded DNA then goes into the nucleus, integrates, and from that point, all the mRNA synthesis occurs, carried out entirely by uh, cellular enzymes. And for the simple retroviruses, transcription is entirely done by the host cell. There are no viral transcriptional co-activators made that would change it.
For HIV, that's not the case. There are coactivators main that modulate transcription, but for these simple retroviruses, the host cell can recognize the viral promoters. So let's talk a little bit about reverse transcriptase, this really interesting enzyme. It, of course, copies a template. It is a template-dependent enzyme, and it needs a primer, but the primer can be RNA or DNA. And as you'll see when we go through the reverse transcriptase reaction, you'll, you'll understand why it has to be that way. But again, the primer serves as a nucleation point for the addition of bases that are complementary to the template, of course. The template, again, read in a three to five prime direction. The new synthesis bases are added in a five to three prime direction. The template can be RNA or DNA. Now, this is a reverse transcriptase. You would think, yeah, it's copying RNA to DNA, but it can also copy DNA to DNA. You'll see in the reproduction scheme why that has to be. And of course, DNTPs are incorporated. It does not make RNA. It only makes DNA. Reverse transcriptase is really old. As it turns out that bacteria and archaea have reverse transcriptase enzymes encoded in their genomes. This is not a viral invention by any means. If you look at the tree of life, right, the three main domains of life, we have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. They all have a common ancestor, as shown by this phylogenetic tree there. So reverse transcriptase must have been present in the common ancestor before it separated into these three branches, because they all have reverse transcriptase. So where did it emerge? Well, here's the idea. You remember, I told you a while ago, we think there was an RNA world many, many years ago, before any cells were on Earth. In the earliest years of evolution of life, we think there was RNA replicating, self-replicating RNA. It did not code for any proteins. It was a pure RNA world. This RNA world got more and more complicated, and at some point, the ability to make proteins emerged, and that was, of course, needed to make cells. So we probably had RNA-based cells, and there's evidence for that, ribosomes, right? These can catalyze protein synthesis without protein. The RNA part of ribosomes is enough to make protein. Ribozymes, uh, RNA sequences that are enzymes, those are all evidence of RNA world. So we have now cells with RNA in them, and at some point, they're making proteins, of course, and an, an enzyme emerges. Probably initially it was an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but then it doesn't take many mutations to make that into an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. And just by accident, you start making DNA, and that has a huge evolutionary advantage because it can be much longer than RNA, it's much more stable, it's much less error-prone. So that's how we think that DNA life forms emerge through the evolution by accident, of course, all life is an accident of reverse transcriptase, and that generated what we now know as modern cellular life, right? Everything on Earth, as far as we know now, is DNA-based except retroviruses and all the other RNA viruses. So that's where we think uh, our reverse transcriptase emerged, and that's why I say it might be the bridge between the early RNA world and the modern DNA world. So we find, in viruses, we find reverse transcriptase uh, in the retroviruses and the hepadnaviridae, uh, which uh, is what hep B is, and also in a plant family, colimoviridae, and we'll unify all of this later. So here's the alignment of the four different nucleic acid polymerases, which you've seen twice before. We have all of them depending on the template and the product, and here is the second one is RNA dependent DNA polymerase or reverse transcriptase. You can see it has the same structural motifs as the other polymerases, the red A, the B, and green C, D, and E. And it also has the, an ASP, ASP in the active site in the yellow part. This is in the palm of the enzyme. And that, those ASPs coordinate the magnesium, which help catalyze nucleotide addition, as we've shown you before. So this is more evidence that these four polymerases all emerged from some common ancestor. Maybe that ancestor was an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and then it diversified into the others. There is another activity associated with reverse transcriptase. It's part of the same enzyme. It's called RNase H. And RNase H cleaves RNA 
when it's in duplex form, double-stranded. It will not cleave single-stranded RNA. It will only cleave RNA when it's in a duplex, and I'm purposely vague because that duplex can be RNA, DNA, or RNA, RNA. It's a double-strand specific enzyme that cuts RNA when, when it's only present in a double-stranded form. And it is an endonuclease, which means it cuts internally as shown by the red arrows. It doesn't chew in from the ends, which would be an exonuclease. There are plenty of those around as well. And it makes short oligonucleotides with a phosphate at the five prime end and a hydroxyl at the three prime end. The bottom line here is that this is chopping up the RNA template. As you'll see, we don't need the RNA template once we make a DNA copy. And in fact, it would get in the way so this enzyme removes it, RNA sage. So this is an integral activity of the polymerase. It's the same polypeptide chain that's part of reverse transcriptase and uh, RNA sage. So here's a structural model of reverse transcriptase. Its, its structure, of course, has been solved by X-ray crystallography many years ago. First, let's take a look at the cartoon at the lower left, which just gives you an overview of the different parts of the molecule. Again, this is reverse transcriptase. It looks like a right hand with a palm domain, which is the active site, fingers and thumb domains with, which cradle the, the nucleic acid. On the left, so the, the active site is, is shown by these two white circles. Those are the uh, magnesium binding sites, if you will, the two asp residues in the active site and those coordinate the magnesium so that catalysis can occur. So the uh, RNA comes in on the left side of the enzyme. You can see it says RNA in here. The RNA passes the active site and then a DNA copy is made. You can see it in blue. So imagine the RNA moving through. It's a DNA strand is being made. Then out of the active sites comes a DNA-RNA hybrid. And then at the other end of the molecule, there is RNA-SH. And in fact, there's, there are two magnesium coordinating amino acids there too, because cutting the DNA, degrading the RNA by RNA-SH is the reverse reaction of polymerizing. And so that's why you have magnesiums there. And as you see, as this duplex passes the RNA-SH active site, which is shown here by this line, the RNA is removed. So out of the enzyme comes a single strand of DNA. So that's how catalysis works. On the upper part of this is a schematic uh, of the enzyme. It's actually a dimer with two subunits, uh, a P66 and a P51 in this particular case. But you can see they become one enzyme. Uh, and you can see the P51 is the lower part. The P66 is the upper part. The palm domain is shown. That is uh, corresponding to the palm, of course, down at the cartoon below. There's, uh, there are the fingers and the thumb. And the active site would be uh, in, the, in the palm, of course. It's not colored yellow as it was in our other diagrams. But there you can see the DNA moving through the active site. And this is very slow. For one genome, which is nine kilobases, it takes four hours to make a DNA copy. Really, really slow. Much slower than our nucleic acid synthesis. And it makes a lot of mistakes. It makes a mistake every 10,000 to 1 million nucleotides. So if it makes a mistake every 10,000 nucleotides, every time it copies the genome, it makes a mistake. Every viral genome in the DNA copy has a mistake. And so, but that drives evolution of viruses, as we'll see later. The reverse transcriptase has revolutionized molecular biology. Which statement about the enzyme is not correct? RT is unique to retroviruses. RT is packaged in the retrovirus particle. RT protein also has RNase H activity. The name of the enzyme comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information and might have bridged the ancient RNA world and the DNA worlds. Uh, so the, the correct answer is reverse transcriptase is unique to retroviruses. It is not. If you're just thinking about viruses, it's in hepatinoviruses, right? But it's not unique to viruses. It's found in R cells. It's found in bacteria and archaea. All the three uh, domains of life have reverse transcriptase. So that is the incorrect answer. The other ones are all correct. So it is packaged in the particle. It does have RNA-SH activity. The name comes from reversing the flow, and it might have bridged the RNA and DNA worlds.
All right, let's take a look at this reverse transcription process. First, let's look at the RNA in the particle. Here's the particle on the upper left, and as you might be guessing from looking at these diagrams, there are two copies of the RNA in the virus particle. So we could say that retroviruses are diploid, if you will. There's two copies of the RNA, and they're shown at the bottom here. Five prime is capped, three prime is polyadenylated. You can see the coding regions that I've told you about, GAG, Paul, and ENV, hybridized, if you will, near the five prime end that keeps them together, and we'll see how that is involved in assembly next time. But this whole RNA, there are two copies, it's coded with nucleocapsid protein. So it's an RNA protein complex, and that is because this pus RNA is not going to be translated. It's going to be copied by reverse transcriptase, so it needs to be coated with this protein. And there are, there are about 50 to 100 molecules of reverse transcriptase in the virus particle, that, that blue dot. So there's not just one, there are quite a few. And the process I'm going to tell you about now, the reverse transcription of these RNAs, is happening by, by a lot of these enzymes. It's, they're probably copying both strands at the same time, as you will see. Now, an interesting feature you might have noticed here is that there seems to be a tRNA stuck on near the five prime end of this viral RNA. And that's correct. This tRNA is actually in the virus particle. It's a cellular tRNA in the particle, and it's hybridized near the five prime end of the viral RNA. And that's going to play an important role in reverse transcription. Why are there two copies of RNA in these particles? We think it is so, it's easier to make a correct genome when you make DNA. So I told you that reverse transcription is error prone, so these viruses have lots of mutations. If you have two copies of the genome and the virus reverse transcriptase switches between strands randomly as it's making a DNA copy, you have a greater chance of making the right sequence in the DNA molecule. Here is one RNA on the top here, and the reverse transcriptase is starting at the right end here, and it's, it's copying down. Just imagine that this copying is not just on one strand. It's flipping back and forth randomly between the two strands. And the result is really a mixture of the two strands. And if there's a lethal mutation on one strand, that kind of jumping will more likely give you an infectious virus particle. So we basically think that it's easier to make a functional genome when you have lots of mutations in it by having uh, two copies of the RNA. And this process of going back and forth you know, you copy a little of one RNA, then you jump to the other, and you go back and forth, back and forth. It's called copy choice. Probably lots of uh, reverse transcriptases doing that. So let's take a look at the reverse transcription process. Let's start with this primer. So again, we have our two viral RNAs at the top, and we're expanding just the very left end below it. We have our cap, the five prime end of the mRNA, uh, and there's our tRNA hybridized. The place in the RNA where the tRNA hybridizes is called the primer binding site, PBS. You're going to see that a lot, and that's all it stands for, which is where the tRNA binds. And then you have a number of other sequences here. These are labeled U5 and R. So R is right near the cap, followed by U5. And then there are a variety of inverted repeats in these sequences as well. On the bottom shows you how the tRNA binds to the RNA. So on the left, the viral RNA, the pri primer binding site, is shown here in the middle. This forms a stem loop structure, and the tRNA is in the middle. And when the tRNA is mixed with the RNA, it insinuates itself into the primer binding site. So you can see part of the tRNA is base pairing with the PBS of the viral RNA. And there is a three prime hydroxyl, which is going to be the initiation site for reverse transcription. So this tRNA is the primer for reverse transcription. Of course, it's an RNA primer, and it's derived from the host cell. The first step is that that primer is recognized by reverse transcriptase, and a DNA is made. So again, this is happening as the RNA comes in the cytoplasm. It is going to be converted to DNA before it goes in the nucleus. So these are the earliest steps. On the left, we have our RNA. And I have brought the ends around to clarify some aspects of that. We have the primer binding site PBS. The tRNA is already hybridized to it. And I want you to notice the two sequences, R and U5. These are, these are batches of sequences at the five prime end of the RNA. And there is at the three prime end of the RNA, there's the poly A, there's another R, and then there's a U3. 
So the five and three prime n both have a little r, and the five, the five prime n has a u5, and the three prime n has a u3. This will be important in a moment. First step of reverse transcription, the enzyme binds the three prime tRNA primer. It makes a short DNA, that's shown in blue. And it can only be short because it reaches the five prime n, there's nowhere else to go. And this, when first discovered, was thought to be very strange, but it makes perfect sense after we go through the whole thing. Now as that DNA is made, the RNA is chopped up, which you can see shown here schematically. The case of these R and U5 regions, whether it's lower or upper case, means that they can be complementary. So a big R is complementary to a little r. That's the significance, because if you make a, a DNA copy of a little r and a little u, you're gonna have a big R and a big u. And that's what we see here. The DNA is capital U5 and capital R. That big R is now gonna be complementary to the little r at the three prime end of the RNA, right there. And that's designated by that uh, little arrow. And what is going to happen is they're going to base pair and the enzyme's gonna continue copying from the three prime end of the viral RNA. And that is shown in this slide. That is called a template exchange because the enzyme was first using a template at the five prime end of the RNA, and then it's jumped over to the three prime end. So the big R and the little r anneal, they base pair, and the polymerase is simply gonna keep copying, and that's shown in the second part in the middle. That blue is copying the RNA from the three prime end, and eventually it will go all the way around uh, to the very beginning. It's not finished here on this slide, but I wanna tell you a few things first. So we have a template exchange, and now uh, we have made U5, R, U3. Now we have added U3 to that mix, which wasn't present originally in the RNA. Remember, the RNA only has R, U3, or R, U5. As this DNA is being made, the RNA is chopped up, but a little bit is left. The PPT is a polypurine tract, which doesn't get chopped up by RNAsH because it's going to serve as a primer for the other strand of DNA, and that's in the third panel here. So as this first strand is still being made, the PPT primer starts to make the second strand. So that's a different enzyme, of course, that's happening at the same time. Eventually, that first strand comes all the way around. It copies the primer binding site. And now uh, you see the, the very three prime end of the single strand DNA is complementary to the primer binding site. Meanwhile, the other strand of DNA is being made. It reaches the tRNA. And there, PBS is copied from the tRNA. The first strand, the PBS is copied from the viral RNA, shown in green. But the other strand, the primer binding site, is copied from the tRNA. Then the tRNA falls off, and we have a second uh, template exchange. That uh, piece of, of DNA, the second strand of DNA, the dark blue, is complementary to the first strand. And it hybridizes, so now you have a circle with a a second strand of DNA bridging it, and that is now going to be completed to make the complete double-stranded DNA. All right, so I'm going to go through it once again. The first strand, it goes all the way to the end of the primer binding site. Second strand goes through the tRNA. The tRNA falls off. So in blue, dark blue, that single-stranded region, that's the primer binding site. And then the blue strand hybridizes with the first strand, and you make the second strand, which is shown on this side. So this is where we left on the last slide. So let's take a look at the blue, the second strand of DNA. Basically, we have to have PBS on the first strand extended through that, for that second dark blue DNA, and that's what's happening here. So not only is that strand gonna be extended around the circle to make a complete double strand in one direction, it's gonna go in the other direction as well. And then the second strand will be completed around the rest of the molecule that's going in the other direction. And in the end, you have a double-stranded DNA copy, but it's not a complete copy of the RNA. It's more, in fact. And I want to show you exactly how it's more. Now we have, look at this DNA. We have two LTRs, first of all. The RNA doesn't have LTRs in it. It has an LTR at the left end, and its sequence is U3, R, U5, and then the primer binding site. And then we have an LTR at the right end which is exactly the same, U3, R, U5, and this happens to have the polypurine tract. If you look at the RNA, here the five prime end, we had R, U5. We didn't have a U3 
at the five prime end of the RNA. At the three prime end of the RNA, we have RU3, but no U5. So it's in the process of reverse transcription that you generate the two complete LTRs, which are not present in the RNA, and that's why you have to do all these weird jumps. The two template jumps are basically to duplicate the end sequences and make or build two LTRs. Now, a couple of years ago, I made a, an animation of this, so if you go to this site, this YouTube link will take you to this where I go through the whole thing as a movie, and it may help to watch that happen to get this sequence of events if you want. In the end, you get from a RNA, in fact, you go from two RNAs to a single molecule of double-stranded DNA. You now have sequences at either end, LTR sequences, that are very important for the reproductive cycle of the virus, as you'll see in a moment. All right, next question. Which of the following steps occurred during reverse transcription of retroviral genomic RNA? Priming of minus DNA synthesis by tRNA, two template exchanges, degradation of the viral RNA by RNA-SH, generation of two LTRs, or all of the above. Almost all of you got all of the above, which is right. Everything is correct. Just some people said two LTRs is the only thing that happens, but obviously you get minus strand priming by tRNA. You get two template exchanges. You also get degradation of the RNA by RNA-SH. So we start with two RNAs. We go to one double-stranded DNA, and what's going to happen is that uh, DNA is going to be integrated into the chromosomal DNA, the cell in which the virus is replicating. So on the top is our retroviral DNA. It's not yet a provirus because it's not integrated. You see the LTR on the left and the LTR on the right. That's going to integrate into a target sequence in the host chromosome. What happens when these retroviral DNAs integrate, and they're, they're catalyzed by a retroviral enzyme called integrase, there are two cardinal features. First, the host target sequence, where this is going to insert, is duplicated. I've shown it in orange here in the middle of the chromosomal DNA, which is purple. When the retroviral DNA integrates, the host target is duplicated. There's one copy on the left, and there's one copy on the right. How that happens, you'll see in a moment. And secondly, you lose some bases at the ends of the LTRs. In this case, we're losing two bases. You see AATG, pre-integration, and just TG, post-integration. So two or three bases are typically chopped off the ends. Again, you'll see why that is. And that gives you a provirus, integrated retroviral DNA in the host chromosome, proviral DNA. We now have host DNA on the left, the duplicated orange sequence from the host. You now have an LTR, which lacks two bases. You have the, the viral DNA encoding gag, pollen, envelope with the PBS and the PPT sites. And then at the right end, another LTR missing two bases and another duplicated host DNA. From that integrated DNA, that proviral DNA, comes by transcription by the host cell, the viral RNA genome. And it's this RNA which is translated to proteins and is also packaged into virus particles. That is what's going to go into virus particles. It is short at either end of the DNA, of the proviral DNA. It's missing sequences at the five prime end because the promoter, which is in the LTR, is not at the very five prime end of the LTR. So the five prime end of the message is missing some five prime sequence and the three prime end terminates short of the three prime end of the LTR. You build LTRs to make a promoter and a terminator for transcription, but those are lost when you make mRNA. And that's why the ends are repeated, so you can rebuild the LTRs when you do reverse transcription and have the promoter and terminator again. So let's look at how integration works. This is an enzyme called integrase. It's coded separately from the reverse transcriptase. Remember, the RT enzyme has reverse transcriptase and RNase H. There is a separate protein known as integrase. It's shown as this orange blob here on the upper left, and it's active as a tetramer. There are four copies of it. So what happens is it binds the retroviral DNA produced by reverse transcription. This is happening now in the nucleus. It chews off bases from both ends of the viral DNA. And you can see that here. Remember, we lost two bases of viral DNA, and that's because they are chewed off from the three prime end 
uh, by the integrase. And if you look at the left figure, we have three prime NNAC and three prime NNAC. The ends are going to be removed. So that's the first step here. We have removal of the two bases. And then those new three prime hydroxyls in a reaction catalyzed by the integrase are going to attack the host target DNA. So the target DNA is from the host cell. Of course, it's laying across the integrase. It's shown in purple there. Uh, the integrase will catalyze an attack of the target sequence. And what you then have is the target sequence joined to each three prime end of the retroviral DNA. That's shown here in panel three. So now you have retroviral DNA joined to host DNA, and there are two gaps left of single-stranded DNA, you can see there. And at this point, the integrase is no longer part of this reaction. Uh, those gaps have to be filled in and repaired and ligated, and that's carried out by host proteins. All right, so the integrase helps in aligning the DNAs and attacking and ligating, but then the gap is filled in by host repair proteins. And I think you can see why the ends are duplicated. Now you have two orange sequences. You've separated the two strands. You've made a single strand of the top and, my, and bottom strand. And then you fill them in so you duplicate the sequence at either end of the viral genome. So this explains why you lose two bases. The integrase takes those off to facilitate uh, the reaction with the host DNA. And then the filling in of the single strands by the repair enzymes of the host duplicates the sequence. So this duplication of sequence is a way of looking at a sequence in a genome and knowing that it's moved around by these kinds of integrase-mediated mechanisms. If, you see, if, you're, if you're sequencing a genome and you see a sequence with repeated uh, host regions at either end, it's a good chance that that moved there by uh, retrotransposition. So here is how the integration works. Again, we've talked about the virus coming into the cytoplasm. The DNA is made, and that's shown there on the upper left. It's imported into the nucleus, and there the integrase will find the chromosomal DNA. In particular, we believe it prefers DNA sequences that are wrapped around a nucleosome. And that's shown on the left-hand figure there. There's DNA wrapped around nucleosomes. The integration complex, which is this uh, complex with the viral DNA, double-stranded DNA in it, uh, and the integrase, which is the yellow protein behind it, is going to direct it to these uh, nucleosomes. It does so because nucleosomes bind specific host proteins called LEDGEF. So LEDGEF, and that's blown up on the right here. So here is a single nucleosome. The DNA is in purple, and it's wrapped around protein, which is shown as black strands here. And LEDGEF is a series of host proteins that bind the uh, host DNA as well as nucleosomal proteins. And the integrase, four copies of the integrase shown in yellow, are not only binding the viral DNA, but they also bind LEDGEF. And you see that they're contacting the host DNA, and so they're going to initiate the integration reaction. This integration is not sequence specific. The only requirement, it appears, is that it, it happens, it tends to happen in DNA wrapped around nucleosomes, perhaps because these proteins direct it there. But there's no sequence specificity. Integration can happen in anywhere pretty much on the chromosome, as long as it's in a nucleosome. And it can happen on any of our chromosomes, so not sequence specific. So the result is we have, again, an integrated copy of the viral DNA, one DNA from two RNAs. And as I said before, you build a strong promoter in the left LTR that's used by the host enzyme to direct transcription to make viral RNA. And of course, the RNA is then translated into proteins, or it can be encapsulated into new virus particles, because that is the same RNA that's going to be in the viral genome. Now, I like to think of this as, as really different from all the other viruses we've talked about, because there's really no DNA replication and there's no RNA replication. What do I mean by that? Well, DNA replication, SV40. You take a molecule of SV40 DNA, comes into cells, and then you have hundreds and thousands made. It doesn't happen here. Let's say RNA replication. Influenza virus RNA comes into the cell, makes thousands and thousands of RNA molecules. That doesn't happen here. You get, of course, 
DNA replication of the provirus when cells divide, and that can certainly happen, but you're not making hundreds and hundreds of copies of DNA. You're making a lot of copies of RNA, but that's done by the host transcriptional machinery, so you're going from DNA to RNA. You're not going from RNA to RNA. So that's what I mean by that. It's kind of a unique mechanism. No DNA replication, no RNA replication, yet these viruses work because the host is being used to do all of this. So here's a summary of what we've said, just to put it in perspective. Virus is binding and fusing at the plasma membrane. The core is in the cytoplasm. Reverse transcription occurs, as we've said, makes a double-stranded DNA that enters the nucleus, is integrated by the activity of integrase. Transcription of the provirus gives you full-length mRNAs or near-full-length mRNAs that give rise to structural proteins and enzymes. And we'll talk more about this next time, how this works. Some of these mRNAs will be exported unspliced from the nucleus and incorporated into new virus particles. And of course, this RNA is also spliced to give a smaller RNA that allows translation of the viral glycoproteins, which are shipped up to the plasma membrane and incorporated into new virus particles. So that is the retrovirus reproductive cycle. Now, if a retrovirus infects you, let's say HIV-1, it infects your T cells, you're not going to pass this provirus on to your offspring because you're not passing on T cells. They're not part of your germline. But if a retrovirus happens to infect a germ cell, it can become what we call endogenized because it be, the provirus is a permanent part of your host cell. Of course, if the cell dies, that doesn't really matter. But if it becomes part of your germline, you can then pass that integrated provirus onto your offspring. But it has to be integrated into a germ cell, either an egg or a sperm cell. And we know this happens because every animal on the planet has copies of endogenous retrovirals DNAs that have been passed on from ancestors. And again, that's because you can't take out this DNA once it's there. So even if it becomes inactivated and doesn't make virus particles, it's still with you and you're going to pass it on to your offspring. So that is called an endogenous retrovirus. That is specifically a provirus in your germline that you can pass on to your offspring. And as I said in the very first lecture, our genomes are full of these endogenous retroviruses. We can see them. Once the human genome was sequenced, we could see, oh my gosh, there are 8% of our DNA is endogenous retroviruses, that is integrated proviruses from ancient retrovirus infections. And I say ancient because we haven't been endogenized for probably millions of years. HIV isn't endogenizing anyone because it doesn't infect germ cells. And so we don't know of any retrovirus that's infecting us right now that would endogenize. So the last endogenization of us, these 8% of our genome that's retroviral, that happened millions of years ago. Before, there were Homo sapiens, of course. But it's been passed down from those ancestors through Homo sapiens to us today. And we all have 8% of our DNA as uh, endogenous retrovirus. And the way that happens is just shown here. You have someone who's infected with a retrovirus, and the infection occurs in germ cells. So as that individual has uh, offspring, the offspring will have the endogenous retrovirus, shown by the red people. Those, those can be making infectious virus, but we notice after a time that these endogenous retroviruses become defective, and they don't make viruses anymore, and that's shown here by the, the pink color, but they continue to be passed on to offspring. We don't lose them for reasons that will become clear uh, in a moment. So there, there are two, two words I want you to understand. Endogenous retrovirus is a provirus in the germ cell that you pass on to your offspring. And endogenization is the process of making an endogenous retrovirus. So you have to infect a germ cell. It has to be established in the population. This takes a long time. Imagine some precursor of Homo sapiens, many, many years ago, is infected. One person, not a person, a precursor of some kind, is infected with a retrovirus that endogenizes the germline. That individual has to survive and pass it on to offspring, who then pass it on and on and on. It takes many, many years for this to spread through the population. And so that leads me to a discussion of what we call retro elements in our DNA. A retro element is a sequence 
that moves around our genome by reverse transcription. And not only do endogenous retroviruses move around, but there are other kinds of DNAs as well that are not viral. Remember, proviral DNA integrated is endogenous retrovirus. We have 8% endogenous retroviral DNA in our genome. They're all defective. They don't make infectious particles. They make particles. You can actually find particles in various cells, retroviral particles, but they're not infectious. But other animals do make infectious retroviruses. For example, mice have lots of endogenous retroviruses in their genome, but they're still making infectious particles that they can spread to other animals. 42% of our genome is made up of mobile genetic elements. You may know them as transposable elements. And that includes endogenous retroviruses, because they can move around, and other retro elements. So endogenous retroviruses got there by infection. The other elements were probably there long before uh, there were retroviruses. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So here are the retro elements in the human genome. On the left is a diagram of them. Let's start with that. At the top left, we have uh, endogenous retroviruses. These come by you being infected by a retrovirus, and it goes into your germline, and it's now passed on to all the offspring. And these you can tell because they have LTRs, and they have gag, Paul, and envelope genes. And the host sequence at either end is repeated, cardinal sign of a retroviral integration. These are often extensively mutated, so they don't make infectious virus particles. But they're there, and you can see particles being made. Another kind of a transposable element is called a retrotransposon. This is probably where retroviruses came from. These retrotransposons were probably in the genomes of animals for many, many years before retroviruses arose. And we think retroviruses arose about 450 million years ago. A retrotransposon looks very much like an endogenous retrovirus, two LTRs, repeated host sequence, gag, pull, but no envelope. There's no way for this to make a particle because there's no envelope like a protein. And so what these are are simply DNAs that can jump around your genome. How do they do that? This region is transcribed into an mRNA. It encodes reverse transcriptase. That will make a DNA copy, which will then go somewhere else and integrate in your genome. And so that's how these retrotransposons amplify. They start out at one place and then move around in your genome. And as you might imagine, they could be good or bad, depending on where they land. We also have uh, another kind of, of mobile element called the line, long interspersed nuclear element. And you can look on the right here and see the percentage of these elements. These are now all non-LTR containing retro elements. You can see 17% of our genome comprises these lines. Uh, they have a duplicated se host sequence at either end, and they have open reading frames that encode for reverse transcriptase. So these can move around also by uh, retrotransposition. We have signs, which are short interspersed nuclear elements. You can see 10% of our genome there. Signs do not encode RT, so they depend on RT produced by lines and retrotransposons to move around the genome. Then we have processed pseudogenes, which are probably mRNAs that were accidentally copied by reverse transcriptase. They become a DNA, and they get integrated back uh, into our genome. So these are all movable elements that can move around the genome. Two things I want to leave you with. First of all, as I said, retrotransposons are probably the progenitors of retroviruses. They were there for many years before retroviruses arose. All they needed was an envelope glycoprotein. And we don't know where that came from, but once that was there, they could then make particles and spread from cell to cell. So they are precursors of retroviruses. Secondly, even though we have 42% retro elements in our genome, less than 0.05% are actually active today, moving around in you as we speak. Very few of them are moving around, but they are. And sometimes this results in human disease. We know certain human diseases that are associated with a retro element moving around. And again, remember, they move around by the production of reverse transcriptase. So even though we have a lot of these DNAs, uh, not many of them are moving around. But the real question is, why do we keep them? Not only these retro elements, the lines, the signs, 
Turns out they all have interesting functions. We don't have time to go into them, but let me tell you about why we keep some endogenous retroviruses. The last human endogenous retrovirus that infected us, or actually didn't infect us because it infected our ancestors, is called HERV-K. And this infected our ancestors over a million years ago. So that was probably the last endogenization event. If you look at human development, here's Homo sapiens, right? The last 100,000 years or so. And then we have ancestors, rodensiensis, et cetera. So these HERV-Ks, a certain kind of endogenous retrovirus, probably infected our ancestors about a million years ago. They became endogenized and they passed them down to us and we have them today. And people have obviously sequenced these and you can look at the sequence and say, this is not so broken and fix it. And a number of labs have repaired these viruses and can grow the virus in labs. So you just take the HERV-K DNA from the human genome, you fix the mutations, and then you can get virus particles produced. Uh, one group in France here has reported it, also a group here at Rockefeller. They call these the Phoenix retroviruses because they brought them back from uh, inactivity. I think it's very interesting that this was circulating over a million years ago, and now we can reconstruct it and find out uh, how it affects cells. What I want to tell you about is the story of the koalas where we can watch endogenization happening in real time. I told you that humans haven't been endogenized for over a million years, but koalas are being endogenized right now before our eyes. So koalas, as you know, only na natively live in Australia. But of course, they're exported all over the world to be in zoos. But we can trace all of them to specific origins in Australia. A number of years ago, koalas in Australia started getting sick. They developed an immunosuppressive disease, and it was associated with opportunistic infections. It turns out this is being caused by a retrovirus that the koalas apparently obtained from mice. So the, the virus jumped from mice uh, to koalas. Not only are they infected and producing virus that they can spread to others, but the virus is endogenizing the germline. And we can see this happening. Here on this map on the right, there's a map of Eastern Australia. And these are sites of known koala colonies. And the pie charts show you the fraction of the colony that is now endogenized with this koala retrovirus. And you can see the colonies in the north are pretty much all endogenized, but those in the south are less so. And there's some colonies on island, islands here you can see. Some of them have no endogenization yet because they're offshore, but you know, eventually it's going to reach all of these. And we can watch these animals become endogenized. So what's happening is, is the adults are infected, the virus goes in a germline, that adult passes it off to its ancestors. And eventually all the koalas in the world will be endogenized unless you take a non-endogenized mating pair, put them somewhere off, away from Australia and uh, breed them elsewhere. Now all the, as far as I know, all the koalas in zoos in the rest of the world are all endogenized already because they derived from some of these animals. So we can actually now watch this virus spread through the germline, so that's very interesting. And of course the other issue is trying to save the koalas from dying uh, from this infection. Now the better side is that sometimes we use these genes for other purposes. So an example is the envelope gene of a retrovirus. So remember the genome encodes gag, pol, and envelope. The envelope is the glycoprotein uh, in the virus particle. It binds a receptor and allows fusion of the virus particle with the cell. I showed you that process that releases the capsid into the cytoplasm. This gene, the envelope gene, has been exapted. It has been taken in an, from an endogenous retroviral gene in, some, in germ lines of mammals many years ago, and it's used to make a placenta. So the ancestors of placental mammals who didn't have placentals, they were infected on multiple occasions. You can see two of them are marked here, uh, 50 and uh, 25 million years ago. They're infected with a retrovirus, and the, the envelope gene was taken by those animals and used to build the placenta. What do I mean by that? Well, the outer layer of cells in a placenta is shown at the bottom here. It's called the syncytiotrophoblast. It is one big fused cell. Lots of little cells form, and then they fuse with each other. Why? Because the envelope glycoprotein is produced on one cell surface. It binds a receptor on the neighboring cell, 
and it catalyzes fusion. That's the job of, of that kind of protein. So the protein that does this is called syncytion, and that's why we call these syncytiotrophoblasts. That name has been around for a long time, and we only recently realized that it was derived from a retroviral envelope gene. So that's what exaptation is, taking a viral gene in an endogenous retrovirus and using it. It usually goes somewhere else in the genome, and then that's where it functions. And this is why many animals have placentas. If it weren't for retroviruses, I don't know, we would have pouches and have our babies in our pouches like marsupials, because that's the last uh, ancestor of placental mammals. And there are many other examples of these retroviral genes being used for other purposes. I just wanted to tell you one as an example. How about chicken eggs? You know, you go to the store, you get a brown egg or a white one. Did you know you could get a blue chicken egg? These are prized in some countries, and farmers breed their chickens so they make all blue eggs. Well, guess what? This is an endogenous retrovirus that sat down in front of the blue pigment gene, and now it makes it all the time so the eggshells are blue. Remember, the LTRs have promoters in them. So if that provirus integrates in front of another gene, it's going to turn it on. So the farmers who were breeding chickens to make blue eggs were simply breeding the ones that had the retrovirus right in front of the blue pigment gene, and that's why they make blue eggs. So I like to say, if it weren't for retroviruses, we'd be laying eggs, and they would be white. But it's not really true because our ancestors were marsupials, not chickens. All right, last question. Uh, which of the following statements about retro elements is not correct? There are many copies in the eukaryotic genome. They are currently entering the koala germline. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They can be beneficial or none of the above. Okay, what is not true is that those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. That is wrong. They do not. They produce particles, but not infectious viruses. They are entering the koala genome, so that's why that's the answer. All right, let's turn to one other family of viruses that has reverse transcriptase in its reproductive cycle, the hepatitis B viruses. We've encountered these before. They are viruses with a DNA genome. That's funny because it's gapped. It has a protein stuck to one end of the DNA and a piece of RNA on the other. And these viruses have reverse transcriptase in their reproductive cycle. That's, that's the genome on the left. It's a circular DNA. And I wanted to show you, look at all these RNAs that are made, overlapping RNAs that go around the circle that can code for different proteins. The way these viruses replicate, the virus uh, binds the core containing the DNA, docks on the nuclear pore. The DNA goes in the nucleus. Remember, this is partially single-stranded, so it has to be repaired first before it can be transcribed. So the repair is done by host cell enzymes, and now we have a double-stranded circular DNA that's wrapped around nucleosomes, and that is the substrate for transcription. We have genome RNAs made and shorter transcripts uh, that encode the virus proteins you need to make new particles and new capsids. Two issues I want to point out. First of all, there's no genome integration. This circular double-stranded DNA is transcribed as a circle. It doesn't have to go into the host DNA, so there's no endogenization with these viruses. Uh, and secondly, these new particles that are made, they're made in the cytoplasm, and they encase a molecule of viral RNA. And if this were a retrovirus, that would then leave the cell, and it would be an RNA virus. But for reasons that are not clear, uh, right in the cytoplasm, these particles, before they're even finished, start to undergo reverse transcription because included with this RNA is a molecule of reverse transcriptase for the hep B. It's called the P protein. And so you end up having reverse transcription occur before these particles even leave the cytoplasm. You can see on the left, step 12, that is actually the final genome that you find in virus particles with the gap and the protein on the 5' prime end and the piece of RNA. And so there, those particles get enveloped and are released. But let me tell you how the genome gets to be so weird. Remember the first day I promised you to explain it, so I'm going to explain it to you now. It's, it's a series of steps very much like reverse transcription of retroviruses. So in the cytoplasm, transcript, which is the viral genome RNA, is made, and that's shown at the upper left here. It's put into a subviral capsid, included as a molecule of reverse transcriptase, 
which is behind the stem loop. It's the orange um, sphere there. And that binds to a stem loop near the five prime end of the RNA. You can tell it's the five prime end. It's a cap. Starts to make a minus strand DNA. You can see that in light blue. But it doesn't go to the five prime end of the RNA. It snaps up in the first template exchange to the three prime end of the RNA, as you can see by that dotted arrow. And polymerization continues from the three prime end. So you end up, the enzyme ends up going around and making a full length plus DNA strand, which you can see there. That's a one template exchange. And remember, at the very end, there's an RNA primer. So this, this input RNA that we started with on the upper left, that persists through all of these steps and it's not removed. It is not removed by the RNA-SH activity of the RT. Uh, the RT then starts to copy to make the other DNA strand. It does so also in a weird way. There's another template exchange where it snaps up to the top strand at the five prime end. You can see there it extends and then it runs out of space. So it has to jump back to the bottom strand. So you end up with one complete strand of negative DNA. It's in light blue and a little bit of plus DNA. And that's where it stops. And that's what you find in virus particles. So you see the primer is still there. So that's the RNA that you find in virus particles. There's a protein at the end of the DNA. That's the reverse transcriptase that's shown here. And then only a little bit of the DNA is double stranded. The rest is single stranded because the RT has not finished completing the strand. And so that's what you end up in the virus particle. That's shown at the right. Partially double stranded, reverse transcriptase stuck on the end of the DNA and a piece of RNA at the other end. So the RT never got off because it didn't finish and the primer is still there, it wasn't removed. Of course, all that is taken out when this DNA gets into a new cell. Why this happens is because reverse transcription begins in the infected cell before the particle is released, but as the particle seals up and is wrapped in a membrane, triphosphates can't get into it anymore. So it runs out of DNTPs, it can't make any more DNA. And it's not until it comes into the, the next cell that that is repaired by the host cell. So that's why you have this funny configuration because these are impatient viruses. They can't wait until the next cell to start reverse transcribing. They start tra reverse transcribing before they are assembled and they make an incomplete DNA copy. So let me end by comparing retroviruses and hepatitis B viruses. And in yellow, in the box, is what's in the virus particle. So here on the lower right, retroviruses, most retroviruses package RNA in the particle. We call them RNA tumor viruses. They go through a DNA intermediate, proviral DNA, but always what is packaged is RNA. And it is not reverse transcribed before those particles leave the cell. It is only reverse transcribed on the new cell when it infects it. Let's compare that to hepatitis B virus. What's in the particle is DNA. So initially RNA is packaged in the cell, but that starts to be reverse transcribed before it leaves the cell, and that's why the re released particles have uh, DNA in them. There are also plant viruses that have a similar cycle as hepatitis B virus. These are called colimoviruses. An example is cauliflower mosaic virus. You know, next time you eat cauliflower, you might be eating some of this. Uh, it has an RNA genome in the cell, but it is packaged as RNA in the particle. But again, it starts to reverse transcribe this so that what comes out in the particles is actually a DNA genome, very much like hepatitis B. And finally, there's one other type of retrovirus. So retrovirus is a family of viruses with many different kinds. Another kind are called foamy retroviruses, which have RNA packaged in the cell in the virus particle. But again, this becomes reverse transcribed before these viruses leave the cell. So although they're closely related to retroviruses, they do this very different. And again, I think it's a matter of them starting reverse transcription before the particles get out of the cell. And in fact, some of these particles have RNA in them, showing that some of them do not complete reverse transcription before leaving the cell, and some of them do. So it kind of gives you a window on a space between retroviruses and hepatitis B viruses. 
All right, so that is the last genome story we're going to tell. Next time, I want to tell you how we can build virus particles of, of the different types that we've talked about.